Welcome to Inc.'s The Founders Project with Alexa Von Tobel. I'm Alexa, the founder of LearnVest, author of New York Times bestselling book, Financially Fearless, and second book, Financially Forward. I'm also the founder and managing partner of Inspired Capital, a venture firm focused on the entrepreneurs of the future. Each week, we sit down with a top founder to share their story of guts, inspiration, and drive. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Alex Von Tobel, and this week, I'm excited for you to meet Jody Bonsall, a multi-unicorn founder who's currently founder and CEO of two companies, Harness, a platform that automates software delivery processes, and Traceable AI, a cybersecurity platform for securing software applications. Both of these companies reflect Jody's passionate belief that software can change the world for the better and build on the success of his first company, AppDynamics, which was acquired by Cisco for $3.7 billion in 2017. In 2008, Jody founded AppDynamics, an application intelligence company that provides enterprises with real-time insights into application performance. In addition to running Harness and Traceable, Jody is highly involved in developing the next generation of technology companies through mentorship and investment. In 2017, he built Big Labs, a startup accelerator aimed at solving extraordinarily difficult technology problems. And in 2018, he co-founded a VC firm called Unusual Ventures. Jody has also been the recipient of many leadership awards, including Forbes Best Cloud Computing CEO to Work For, Best CEO by San Francisco Business Times, and Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year in Northern California. Jody received his BS in computer science from the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. He is a prolific inventor and has more than 25 U.S. patents under his name. And with that, let's welcome Jody. So let's start first with App Dynamics, your first startup, which was acquired by Cisco. What was App Dynamics? Where did the idea come from? And take us back to those early days. And we're going to go through all the things you've started. <laughs> sure. When I started App Dynamics, I was working as a as an engineering manager, engineering leader. And one of the things I saw was that things go wrong in software all the time. Like, you know, we go to a website, we go to a mobile app and things slow down or sometimes things crash. And the engineers don't really have a good way to troubleshoot and fix it. And as an engineer, I experienced it myself. And I was like, we need to do something about this thing. There has to be better troubleshooting diagnostics uh, solutions for some, when something goes wrong in software. And that was the idea behind AppDynamics. Like, let's try to go and solve this problem. When you started AppDynamics, you quickly went from a startup engineer to CEO. What did you learn in that first year, what it was like to be a founder? How to do business and how to inspire people and uh, manage people. When you start any anything, you know, it's really, really, especially as a tech company, there are three key skills, I feel like and there's a technology, there is a business and there's people. And technology was kind of natural to me as an engineer turned CEO. But as CEO, I need to learn how to operate the business, which a big part was like raising capital, you know, making sure the product has the right uh, product market fit, the business elements of it. But the, the biggest part was also to hire and recruit people and inspire people to join you, you know, because there are, you're a one person, two person, three person company, and how do you get the best people to join you? And those are the things you learn in the first year and kind of struggle the most in the first year. Walk through for people who maybe don't know what App Dynamics does. What does App Dynamics do, and how did you get to product market fit? If you go to some website, let's say Expedia.com, and it's slow or things are are not working as as you expect as a consumer, the engineers at Expedia have to know that things were slow and bad, and they have to fix it. That's what App Dynamics did. That App Dynamics provided this automatic visibility to the engineers and in companies like these, and then provided them hey, this is your consumers are having a bad experience. And this is where the root cause of that bad experience is. You have to go and fix this thing in your code or fix this thing in, in your servers or whatever, right? That's what AppDynamics did. And, you know, every business becoming a software business, so everyone had these challenges. You know, one of our early customers was Netflix at that time, and Netflix was just starting to get into the, the streaming business. And they were trying to figure out, like, you know, the streaming experience should not be slow. So, you know, that's, if something went bad in the streaming experience, they needed, you know, products like AppDynamics to, uh, for their engineers to go and fix it quickly. But finding a product market fit is a hard exercise. That's the hardest exercise any startup goes through, you know, as most founders would, uh, would, would realize that. But you have this idea, like I had this idea that, you know, when things go slow down, slow in, the, in software, people need tools to figure it out and fix it. But how do you make it up into, into a product that will really work, into a product that people will really buy, you know, and, and you know, that how would the technology really work? You know, is, would people pay for a solution like this? That's an, that's an exercise. And my formula is pretty simple. Like, you know, talk to a lot of customers or potential customers, like 30, 40, 50, 70, and synthesize your learnings from it to build the right product market fit. In January of 2017, AppDynamics was set to go public, but two nights before the IPO, 
Cisco came in and acquired the company for $3.7 billion. Can you just walk us through what was that like for you? Sure. We were going on, going IPO. We were on the IPO path. And as, as you know, a lot of prep goes into IPO. We are very excited to, to go and ring the bell on NASDAQ. And Cisco came in about a week before the IPO. And they said, you know, hey, uh, can we acquire you instead of uh, are you going public? And they made a proposal, you know, a number. Uh, we looked at it as board, investors, company. We said no to the first offer. You know, a day or two later, they came with a second offer. And we went through it and we said, no, we want to continue the IPO path. We said no to the second offer. And then they came with a third offer, which was uh, $3.7 billion, which was, you know, significant increase from where we would have taken the company IPO at. So, you know, even though the, the number $3.7 billion seems so good and big, but it's still a very hard decision to take to, do you sell the company, do you not, do you go public or not? You know, it's, you have stakeholders, your employees, you know, your, the, the founders, obviously, in the, uh, uh, you know, your investors. Everyone uh, have different opinions around this, but you, you know, at the, and then to me, it was like, you know, this was the right thing for all the, the shareholders involved, you know, especially our employees who have worked in for, for many, many years. This is a great outcome, great exit, de-risk, you know, a lot of things. So we decided to take it, but we did put a condition like, you know, it has to be signed in the next day before we go IPO, you know, so the thing that a process that can take like a month to sign an agreement to acquire was done literally in 24 hours. And I remember like, you know, being in the lawyer's offices, like no sleep for 36 hours and, you know, everyone bringing down an agreement there. And then we signed and, and announced it. There was an interesting part of the story where like, you know, uh, when you're going public, it's a big deal for a company like ours. Like, so we had like our, our uh, like our, most of our early employees, like about 20, 25 people in New York already to ring the bell. Like, you know, we had a big party plan. We wanted to ring the bell. And many of these were engineers who don't even own a suit most of the time. And they had like specially suits made for the, you know, our ceremony and NASDAQ and they were all there. And then I was calling them. It's like, hey, we decided to not go IPO. We are selling the company. <laughs> and so you guys all have to come back. And everyone was really sad because like, hey, we are in New York with our special suits to, you know, for the IPO. And uh, so one thing we negotiated with Cisco, Cisco is a big player on, on NASDAQ. So we negotiated with Cisco. It's like, okay, if we close this deal, can we still go and ring the bell on NASDAQ? And Cisco did pull some strings. And, you know, after the deal was officially closed, the same group, we went to NASDAQ and we did still ring the bell. Do you remember those 36 hours in, the, in, in your lawyer's office? Like, do you remember the emotions going through your head? Where were you emotionally? You know, it's it's emotionally very, uh, it's it's a roller coaster. Like, you know, you are in this high of all of this happening. But at the same time, like, you know, it's kind of the end of a journey. So it's, it's there is that element of it. Like, you know, when it sinks in, it's the end of the journey. It's, uh, I would say, it's, it's it's bittersweet for sure. But, you know, it's a little bit depressing also. Like, you know, when you realize, okay, it's, it's the end of a, you know, for me, it was a nine-year journey. I was, I put like nine years of every moment of my life pretty much into into building building the company and then it's just the realization that okay this is going to end so you're happy about it because it's a great outcome for everyone you know and but it's the same time like you know the end of the journey part makes it sad for sure and soon after the acquisition was over you started another company you started harness um what is harness in your own words and what was the aha moment like i don't even know how you had enough brain cells to come up with another idea but you did where did that come from well uh the idea for harness came from you know, my experience at AppDynamics, you know, the customers at AppDynamics that I was talking to, these are like software engineering organizations trying to figure out like, you know, when something goes wrong in the software, how do you fix it? But a lot of times these people will talk about like, you know, we have so many challenges about just shipping software, like our engineers write code and the whole process of shipping software is broken. Like it takes so much time and engineers are wasting so much time and everyone is frustrated. And I will hear that from AppDynamics customers all the time. And, you know, I saw that inside AppDynamics at that time, like, you know, we were about 1,500 employees. You know, inside AppDynamics, it was the same challenge that just our engineers were always struggling to ship code. After the AppDynamics sale, I did, my first uh, instinct was to try to retire. So I, I retired for about six months. And, you know, which was about, like, do everything uh, that I had, was on my wish list, like a lot of travel, you know, uh, safaris in Africa and hike in Machu Picchu and you know, uh, tracking in Himalayas, in Bhutan. I did all of that, but six months after six months, I was kind of done. <laughs> I was like, I need to, to do something that I'm, I'm passionate about again. And um, uh, and I, I this problem was always kind of burning uh, in my head because I heard it all the time from, from Abdanamis customers. And that's when I said, okay, let's, let's start a company to, to try to solve this. Not even 
that much longer later, uh, you founded Traceable AI in 2019, your third company. Where did Traceable come from? Yeah, you know, Traceable also came from a lot of the conversations that I was having with, with customers at AppDynamics and at Harness. You know, which is the, a lot of these people were talking about, like, we're we are modernizing our software. You know, everything is moving to the cloud. Everything is much more modern. And it's all, in, in the modern cloud world, security is a big challenge. Like, you know, you have all the software you're writing and people are going to hack that software at some point. And that's what Traceable is about. Like, you know, how do we secure all the, all the code that people are writing? So you, you will see, like, there's a, there's, a, there's a theme in my three companies. Like, you know, my first company, AppDynamics, was about software engineers are writing all this code and something goes wrong in the code. How do you help them fix it? My second company, Harness, is about how do you make all of that process simplified? Like, you know, people write code and what you, you know, and by the time you ship the code to the, your consumers, it's a very complex, sophisticated process. So how do you simplify that process? So that was my, that was my second company, Harnesses. My third company, Traceable, is about how do you secure all this code? But this code is eventually going to be hacked if you don't secure it properly, you know, and that becomes a big cybersecurity threat. And we are seeing so much cybersecurity challenges around securing software. What is your ideation process? And when, Jody, do you feel like you're at the point where you know it's worth pursuing? I am always full of ideas. I have so many ideas all the time. And the, the challenge is sometimes like, you know, which idea to, to, uh, uh, to work on versus not. And uh, so I actually even started a lab, I call it Big Labs which is really about ideation and like just, you know, researching and prototyping on which ideas to pursue. And, you know, Harness and Traceable kind of came out of the, that ideation, ideation lab in some ways for me. And it was just a lab for me to have like, you know, some, some research before I would start something. Right? And though, so my process is, you know, I'll, I, I keep a list of ideas that I'm passionate about, you know, that, that, uh, uh, but then I look at like, you know, is this a big bit of problem? Like, can I build a, massive multi-billion dollar company you know if i if i solve this problem in the in, in in the right kind of way and you have to look at like you know how big is the market you know how big the market could be what are the adjacent parts of the market you know is there a room to create a platform like you know, i don't want to spend like you know a lot of time building like a point product like ideally where i could build up build a platform so that's definitely something I, I look for the second thing i look for in that space is like you know can i create some differentiated technology solution something that has a good technology mode to it Right. You know, so it's like if you if you if you have a problem that you 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 can solve, uh, but is your solution has a some good strong technology mode that you can keep three years, five years, seven years kind of a, a advantage on that. The third thing I look for is, am I passionate about this? Am I passionate about this to to spend the next, you know, seven to ten years of my life on this? And that's that one is probably the most important one because you know, anytime you do a company. It takes time, you know, it's, uh, you have to commit your time, you have to spend, you know, um, many, many years. And if you're not passionate about the problem and you don't care about the problem, hard things will happen. One of the things you said that I really liked is you said that some parts of company building actually get easier during a recession. Let's get into the nitty gritty. What parts of company building actually get better? To me, the number one thing that gets better is focus. Like, you know, when, when, when you are in this kind of a, uh, like very loose boom environment, there is no incentive to focus. You know, the focus on simple things like, you know, is your product really good? You know, are your customers happy? You know, are you, are you delivering value to your customers? You know, those are the things you need to focus on. But the problem is like, you know, when all of this, uh, you know, this easy money and the boom in the economy and all of that happening in this heart, it, it, it gets much harder. I almost feel like, you know, uh, my first company, App Dynamics, I started in, you know, in 2008 and the big, big financial crisis hit like four months after I started. It was like two years of like completely fundraising winter. There was no fundraising. There was nothing. And it just forced us to focus and like, you know, build the best product, get the customers, win them. And that was, that really made us a very strong company. When we came out of that in 2010, 11, we were such a strong company and the strong foundation of the company because of that, that financial crisis. So it, I do think crisis could be an opportunity. You know, it's, uh, it allows you to focus and, and do the right things. What advice would you give the founders right now? How would you advise people who now have to get there? My advice would be to use this uh, recession or slowdown as an opportunity to try to change the culture, uh, which is, you know, the people are more receptive to it. Like, you know, your teams, your employees are more receptive to it. If two years ago you were having a conversation with your team that, you know, we need to do things more efficiently or we need to focus on things that really, really matter and not do the all the the peripheral things that may not make any impact. 
it your teams would not be as receptive and you would have to argue with your teams much more and try to convince them and maybe even you would not as a ceo and founder even you would not be thinking about it that much because your board your investors would not care about it as well so i do think this is an opportunity to change the culture because now it's like everyone in the teams know what's going on in the in the industry in the economy you know if you if you have the conversation with them that there is scarcity of capital there is scarcity of you know how we are valued as a company you know that the whole dynamic has changed the market so we need to get to this point two years from now and we need to manage towards it and we need to rethink how we operate and you know uh, by in a more focused manner in a more efficient manner and it can it's it could be a trigger point to change the culture so one last point on that so what advice would you give to ceos that are fundamentally trying to rewire culture so the the approach that i have technically you know i've always used in my companies is you know doesn't matter how much capital you have raised you know you have to run lean and efficient and you know and and drive high growth all the time like you know you're you're building more products driving high growth and you have this culture of running fast running fast running fast and uh, to get there so i feel lucky that i didn't have to go through that much of an adjustment there's some adjustment but not 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 too much but i would say founders who have set up the companies you know with 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 a different dna which is what happened and they started in this 2015 16 19 all of that you have to shock the system a little bit you know because there is no other way like you know how would you survive you know there's just you cannot survive through this uh, you know if your company is so profitable that you are fine with it then is then which is not the case for most uh, you know almost any startup you know so uh, you, so you have to survive i think you it's uh, the survival instinct or you know that scarcity that's there and the survival instinct that will come out of it will shock you out of this and you know maybe not all your team members will be comfortable with it and that is okay like you know what's your choice as a as 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 a founder ceo like you know let the company die or 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 change the the culture in the company to 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 survive like you know it's the, the best thing for all employees who are probably shareholders as well is to for the company to succeed so you you have to repeat that as the message to your team that is not about like you know that you're doing for the you know it's uh, you know in most startups every employee is a shareholder that's where the value creation is happening for most employees so what is right for them as a shareholder is what how how they should they should communicate if we fast forward a decade can you give us one or two of your predictions of where the category is going and what what is obvious to you will happen that probably isn't obvious to everybody that hasn't spent all their time thinking about the category sure. you know the the most obvious thing to me that for a lot of people is not is is the amount of money spent in software engineering so there are there are about 30 million software developers in the world right now and you know the the cost of a software engineer if you look at us and europe and india and china if you average out across the world it's about it's at least $100,000 a year so you're we are looking at 3 trillion dollars a year being spent uh, you know on writing software code out of this 3 trillion dollars a year about 50% is waste because there's so many inefficiencies in how people do software engineering so we are looking at a 1 and a half trillion dollar market right now and the number of software engineers in the world is increasing from 30 million to 50 million in the next 10 years uh, you know 10 15 years so we are looking at like you know 2 to 1/2 trillion dollars of waste that's happening in this that could make everything so go so much faster in the world if software engineers are doing the job better the big trend that i see is 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 the use of ai you know i i think automation and ai is the primary way the developers will become much more efficient there's so much just unnecessary grunt work that happens you know the, all the time that's where people are is wasting so much time and i do think like you know the the open ai chat gpt uh, all the generative ai uh, advances are very powerful just the ability to automate everything uh, you know even before that that's extremely powerful that's that's a big trend that we're going to see you know how do you how do you bring like you know the right checks and balances in the software engineering devops processes that doesn't slow down engineers that would be very key and we'll be right back after a message from our sponsors Jody I want to transition to you can you go back and tell me one or two things that your parents did that really stands out I would say the things that that my parents did well and kind of instill it is like the one is hard work hard work is 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 important like it's hard to succeed without hard work and it's like creating that work ethic you know even as a, as as a kid so that's something I always continue always always continue with me second is um, you know learning constant learning you know uh, my parents even growing up in a small town in in India were big on education and learning like you know if you need to if you have to succeed you have to learn more and more and more and you know they would always find ways for you know to buy me anything i could to learn like you know books to everything you know to always encourage uh, you know the children to go to the best schools and get the most education 
You've said that your motto as an entrepreneur is don't overcomplicate things. Mm -hmm. How have you done that successfully throughout your career? Give us an example of what you mean by don't overcomplicate things. You know, uh, as an entrepreneur, you know, there's so many things going around you and, you know, there's so many books of, you know, advice and blogs and so many advisors and investors telling you so many different things. And it can get overwhelming and can get very complicated. And I see like entrepreneurs and I did the same mistake early on was like, you know, you're thinking about what will happen five years from now and what will happen when you get to a certain stage as a company. And, you know, I, I soon realized like it's all all makes it too complicated in your head. You can't even manage the, it, it, what's it, all of that in your head. So I like to keep things very simple, like, you know, what do you need to get to the next milestone and whatever the next milestone is like the next milestone could be get to your first million of revenue. Next milestone could be get your first 10 million of revenue and, you know, and get a very strong product market kind of fit there. You know, next milestone could be like get to your series B funding or series C funding and you need to get and you work backwards from that next milestone. Like, you know, I do need to I for me to get to my series C funding. This is what I need. I, I need this much revenue. I need this kind of product traction. I need to show this in the, you know, from a competitive platform perspective in the market. The second form, the second approach I use is like, you know, and now this is after a lot of experience from my first company and all is, you know, I have boiled it down to, I call it my five point simple formula, you know, which is <laughs> sounds simple, but it's, it's, it's really like, you know, the five things as, as, as a CEO, you have to focus on with what I look at in, 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 our, in our current of industry. One is the, the market size, like, you know, your TAM is, is good and is growing, which means like, you know, you're focusing always on. Like you're expanding your time and, uh, you know, you're not foc not going after a small market. Your market is large and constantly growing, either either naturally growing or you are growing it by by building more things in the to go into adjacent market. Second thing I look at is like you know, your product is among the best in the market. I look at it. It has to be in the top three in the market, at least ideally top one. And you just keep obsessing with that. Third thing I look at is uh, you have to bring strong go to market execution to it. Like you, if you have a large market, good product you still need to make sure the go-to-market is very strong. Sales, marketing, you know, how do you go after it? Fourth is, uh, you know, take care of your customers and no lip service to it, like really, really taking care of your customers. And fifth is like, you know, you have the right culture in the company. Culture that's like, you know, open, transparent, empowering. What are your time management tips? <laughs> Give us your like two or three quick best time management tips. My number one time management tip that I use for myself is to not think about time management in terms of like, where do I spend more time? I think of like, you know, where do I make more impact? And it's all impact based for me. Like, you know, I don't want to spend time on things where it's not going to make an impact. Impact as in like, you know, either positive impact or, or negative impact. So almost everything I do is, is kind of measured. I measure it with that kind of framework. Like, is it going to make an impact or not? Like, do I really need to spend time on this? And sometimes you need to spend more time on something. The biggest impact I can make on in the company right now is in, in say, is to build this new product. So that's where a lot of my time will go. Or like, you know, most impact I can make right now is to make sure we are financially in a sound position, you know, for the next few years. So that's where my time would go mostly, right? The second thing is, 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 is like hiring the right people and making sure like, you know, you can create right alignment with people. Like, you know, there's no way to scale your time, you know, if you don't have, you know, your, a team that you can trust and people you can trust, uh, you know, to work with you well. And that's something like, you know, over time, I've gotten much better, like, you know, on, on how to how to hire the right people, how to delegate and but still create a good alignment. Right. So you know, I, call, I call it like the you want to find people who you can do mind meld, like, you know, where they you got to the point where they they know how you think, you know how they think and they're on the same same mind meld. And that allows you to, like, you know, scale yourself, scale, 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 scale your time. So that's a, that, that, that's a key part of the grid. What's the one or two things that you could pay forward to other people about how you manage when things are really, truly stressful? What do you do? I think the, the important thing for me that I've learned over time is the don't stress about things you can't control. You know, so if that's like 80% of the stuff. So if you can, if you can focus your, your all your mental energy on 20% of the things that you really can make, a, make a difference. I see like so many people worrying about things you really can't do anything about. Anything about something, don't worry about it. If you can do something about it, just go do it. Don't stress about it, just go do it. And uh, and that's that's the way I, I I try to manage stress. But you know it, these these jobs could be stressful. Also, it's important to get the right team around you that you can share with. So I, I call it like collective problem solving. Like we are all in the same boat. So like ideally, 
you know, we should solve the problems more, you know, collectively together. As a founder, is there anything you hold as sacred? For me, the number one thing is like, you know, I want to get a great outcome, like, you know, that we succeeded in our, in our journey, but I also want to do it the right way. Like, you know, one thing that I, I hold very sacred is like 20 years from now, if I look back at the, let's say I look back at the journey at Abdanamix or journey at Harness or Traceable or whatever, there should not be anything that I should feel bad about or anyone should feel bad about. So that's something like, you know, I, I look at from that lens, like, you know, how would this be judged 20, 30 years from now is would be what I feel bad about that, you know, what we did or, or anyone would feel bad about what we did. We can be all very fin- successful and, you know, but if you feel bad about how we got there, it's not worth it. Jody, I'm going to move towards a quick fire round. I'm going to ask you a question about the first thing that comes to your mind. And the first is going to be, what has been the biggest pinch me moment in your professional career? The, the first investment, Series A investment I got in Abdanomics because I was just starting as an engineer in my late 20s, first time founder, no experience, trying to raise capital, you know, got 30 rejections. Uh, and then like, you know, the first time an investor came and, okay, we'll give you $5 million. And that was really the pinch me moment. Like, okay, this is real. What is an interview question you love to ask to really get to know somebody? What What is it? For me, it's one of the very basic questions, which is, I really love to ask people is, what are they most proud of? And I, to me, that question tells a lot about someone like you know if what they think they are proud of and then i like to kind of feel into it like you know how if they're proud of something why are they proud about it like you know what did they bring it to to got to that point and that to me is like you know what people take pride in is a good very good reflection of like you know who they are and what they what they would end up doing and take more pride in you know if they are your work they're working for you is there a book that's changed your life and it doesn't have to be a business book any book a book that you've read in your lifetime that left a dent, left a mark on you? I do think the, my still, one of my favorite business books is Good to Great. You know, you read about like, you know, how you can build great companies and how you think about it. You know, when one of the early business books I read when I was starting Abdanomics and definitely, you know, made up, made a big impact on me. Last question. Uh, is there a quote or motto or something that kind of runs through your head over the last 20 years? that it is just a way you live life. So is there a motto or a quote or something that is just sort of a, an important pillar for you? The quote that I like is uh, Gandhi's uh, quote, like, you know, be the, be the change you, you want the world to be. You know, it's like many times like people talk and not go and do it themselves. I like to like, you know, if you want to get something changed, go and do it and make, make the change happen. And that's the motto I, I like to live with. I love that so much. Jody. first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. Everybody out there, if you want to learn more about many of the companies, you can head to harness.io, traceable.ai. You can check out Jody on LinkedIn. And you can join us next week for Inc. The Founders Project with Alexa Von Tobel. And I will speak for everybody. I just can't w- wait to see what you do next, which is the exciting part. It, it's for me obvious that you are not even on the eight or ninth inning of your career. We're very much at the beginning, which is pretty exciting. So Jody, lovely, lovely to meet you. Thank you. We're rooting for you. Good to be here.